Amen. So the good news is uh, this morning we're only going to be covering five sentences in the Bible. So if you read through the entire chapter, first chapter, we find that there are only five sentences here. Okay? But Paul, being a very eloquent speaker, being a very eloquent writer, has some very long sentences, some of them being five, six verses onwards. So only five sentences this morning. So we should be done pretty quick, right? Okay. We should be done pretty quick. <laughs> well, we'll see. Okay, so um, uh, hopefully we get through all of them. We'll, we'll see what happens. So we, we see here um, Paul is writing to those uh, believers, the, that church at Ephesus. He says, to the saints, so he's writing to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Well, the faithful in Christ Jesus, that would be believers everywhere who are um, faithful in Christ Jesus. That means they're, they're serving within Christ's new covenant, within his body. Okay, they're members of churches. Okay, so what, what are saints? We talked about this last time when we were going through the book of Hebrews. What, are, what is a saint? Anyone? A saint is a living believer. Yes, a living believer. And it specifically means someone who is set apart for holy use, for a holy purpose. Okay? Consecrated to the Lord. So the, the, the word is, is uh, the word ha, hagio. Yeah, hagios, which uh, it means sacred. It means holy, pure. Okay? And so it, the, the audience is very specific. We we're talking about those who have been consecrated within the new covenant. Okay? And, the, and then the people at Ephesus, can you tell me, are they Jews or are they Gentiles? We haven't read through the whole book yet, but if you had to guess, Jews or Gentiles? Gentiles. Yes, mostly Gentiles. Um, and, and we'll see that throughout the book that Paul addresses this point. He actually makes it clear to us that they are Gentiles. So... But it's also written to us, too. It's written to all believers who are following within the new covenant. So we see here it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ, of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Going on, so that's the first sentence. We've got sentence one out of the way. Okay, now we're going to go on to sentence number two. Sentence number two comprises four verses. Okay, and we have to be careful when we're studying each of these sentences that one, we get the context. Two, we have to understand what is the subject of the sentence. Okay, who is it talking about? What is it talking about? Okay, we have to get that because if we don't get that we can end up really misunderstanding what Paul's point is what his message is so he says blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So I know that's one sentence, but I had to take several breaths there. So it's, it's a long one. It's a big one. And so... What is this saying? This, this 
sentence here is giving praise and glory to God and also to Jesus Christ. What is it giving praise and glory to him for? Well, first, let's go to, um, let's go back here to he hath chosen. So in verse 4, it says, according as he hath chosen. That word there is eklegomai. It's a combination of, of ek, which is a preposition, in lego, to put forth. So he, he has put forth. It means um, to select, to choose. Okay. So, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Well, us in him. Who is that? Who is us in him? Any guesses? Okay, well, is it exclusive? Is it everyone who's saved? Or is it more specific than that? Let's go down to uh, verse 22 and 23, okay, because he really summarizes it up here. And, and we're going to go back, but let's go down to verse 22 and verse uh, 23, okay. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So I think he's being even more specific than when he says us in him. He's being more specific in that he's saying those who are within the new covenant, who are believers and who are within Christ's body, serving within a New Testament church. Okay? So it's specific to those, to, to those who are serving within a New Testament church. Okay, us in him is specific to, and, and you know, we'll see that that's just a few sentences later that he says that, that the body, which is us. Okay, so that, that I believe is what he's referring to here when he says us in him, according as he hath chosen that us in him, okay, and he chose this before the foundation of the world, and, and he's still continuing the sentence on here. He, we haven't gotten to the colon yet, okay, to say what he has chosen about us in him. But he has said that, you know, that we should be holy, because of this, we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us. So now we get to the actual subject of the sentence. What has he chosen for those who are part of his body? What did he choose before the foundation of the world? What did he plan? That those who are within the body will be part of this adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself. Okay, it says, to the adoption, having predestinated us unto the, that comes right after the colon. So this is the, the main crux of the of what he has done, why we are giving him praise, is because God planned before the foundation of the world that he had a plan that us in him would be unto the adoption of children. Okay, and the word there, adoption of children, it's actually a conjugation of two words. It's hoiothesia. Uh, hoiothesia. That word hoio, uh, it is actually the word hoios. Hoios. And this is, th there's many times that we read through the scriptures and we'll see different times where it mentions children or son. Um, and there's different words that are used. Okay, but this one, huyas, when we went through the book of Hebrews, every single time this wor word was used, this usually gets translated as son or sons. The reason why it gets translated is that because it was a legal term 
that was used to say, to speak about the lineage and to speak about uh, the son that would inherit. So it always had to do with inheritance and lineage. So it usually had to do with the son, usually the oldest son, but, or the, the sons that would inherit the things from the father. Okay, so if you go through and you, you do a study on this word, it's in contrast to the word technon, which is just generally children, okay? Which just means, you know, children in general. So if I'm going to say, ah, there's a bunch of children gathered here, okay? I'm not really talking about their lineage. I'm not really talking in a legal sense about that they're going to be inheriting anything. I'm just saying they're children. They're small children. Technon, okay? And uh, we'll, we'll see a couple of different words as we go through the book of Ephesians for children, okay? But that's the main crux of this word. Adoption meaning to, to um, pull into that... They, they didn't belong. Initially, they were not part of this lineage. They were not part of this heritage. But that they were adopted to become, in a legal sense, part of the lineage and part of, to have right to the inheritance of God. Okay? And we're going to see as we go through the book of Ephesians, as we go through this chapter here too, how it talks about this word inheritance many, many times throughout this, this chapter. Okay? So that's really, it's, it's really at the core of what it's talking about here. And, and so, now that, that doesn't mean, okay, so in the, in the, in the scriptures we, we know that in heaven there will be no male or female. Okay, so even though this word is often used in a male sense, because um, because today um, you know we have we, we follow the pictures and, and types which God gave us of marriage of of in, in how traditionally you know the the firstborn son would inherit the carry on the family name. Okay, this is tradition. Um, but that doesn't mean that this is exclusive when Paul's using these words here that, that he's saying that only men in the church will be able to inherit things in the Lord. No. Because as Paul says, let's go to Galatians chapter 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And so that inheritance is, does not matter about gender, okay, because when we get to heaven, as Jesus also said, there is no male or female in heaven, okay? So we're all going to be, in that sense, sons, weos. So, but that doesn't mean that in this flesh that we relinquish these types and pictures God gave us with marriage and the family. The, these had a very important role because they, because they convey eternal truths about Jesus Christ and his church. And we're also going to see that in Ephesians chapter 5, how those things were pictures and types of Jesus Christ and his New Testament church. So, you know, that doesn't mean that we should necessarily, in the flesh here, throw out the gender roles that God has given us, because they are still important. They still help to convey to the world God's truths. They still help us to, to remind us, to remind our children about God's truths, and that's why it's important that we, you know, follow God's plan for marriage and the family, etc. So, and then continuing on to verse 6, it says, and glory to Jesus because he hath made it. So the, the focus of verse 6 is talking about to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And I believe that, that he there is Jesus, but you could apply it to either the Father or to Jesus, okay? Um, because they're one and the same. So Paul doesn't, he doesn't get too too particular there on clarifying which one he is referring to because they are one and the same. 
But what is the point of these four verses? We know it's to give praise to God and the Father, to God the Father and to his Son, Jesus, but praise for what? So we have two options here. We can say that Paul is giving praise to God for choosing, I'm going to give you two options, okay, and then we're going to discuss, weigh both these options. One, he, or A, let's say A, for choosing certain people to be saved over others. Okay, there's option A, okay. Or option B, for God making this plan before time began, an opportunity for all mankind to, who has come to him and repented and believed to be able to receive these spiritual blessings in the heavens that is an eternal e inheritance, a pathway for us to be entitled to this inheritance, and also glory to Jesus for acting out God's new covenant plan. So we've got these two choices. Either we're just going to say it's, oh, you know what, we're going to put a period after, let's put a period after, um, where is it? According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Let's put a period there. And then we get option A. If we put a period there, we get option A. Right? But there's not a period there. There's a comma. And the sentence goes on for several more verses. And if we don't read the rest of that sentence, we're really going to be confused on what exactly Paul is talking about here. So I, I'll give you a few things, a few reasons why I am certain it is not option A. Why I'm certain it is option B. The focus of these verses are not about salvation. The focus of these verses are about eternal inheritance. They're about eternal inheritance. The second thing I would bring up is why does it say in verse four, why does it say that we should be? Why does it not say will be or must be? Okay, without even looking, continuing on to the rest of the, the verses here, it says that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. It's like if I said, you know, okay, my, my daughter Alicia, you should follow what your parents say. When I say that, that doesn't mean that she will. It doesn't mean that, you know, that, that it is going, no, it should happen. I want it to happen. It's my desire that that happen. But it doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to be the case. She still has a choice in the matter. So we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Okay? Having, and then continuing on there, having predestinated before time, having predestinated those who are within his body, within the church, to be uh, unto the adoption of children, being put within that lineage, whether they're Jew or Gentile, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. So, so what I see here, though, is that God the Father made this plan before time began. He made this plan of the new covenant, the New Testament church, this plan in which, you know, he Paul calls it a mystery that was not revealed before, that we, mankind, would be able to inherit all things with Jesus Christ. Okay? And that Jesus Christ enacted this plan. Jesus Christ is the one who came and uh, gave his life. Oh, God, God the Son came in the flesh to give his life for us. Okay? So we're going to see a lot of parallels between the book of Hebrews and the book of Ephesians as we go through. But Ephesians, fortunately for us, isn't going to have a bunch of references to the Old Testament because Hebrews was for the Hebrews, right? But, it, you know, that's all good. That's all good because it's, it all gives us, it gives us that context but now that we go through, this is actually a book written to the Gentiles. Now, moving on, to, to, do we have any questions about verse 3 through 6 before we continue onward? Do you see how that is, how that is describing about God's plan 
before giving praise to God for his plan before the foundation of the world and how we're part of that plan. Okay? But that doesn't mean that, that we have to be part of that plan. It doesn't mean that... Um, so again, this isn't about salvation. It's not talking about salvation, but it's talking about our step, steps after salvation for us to be part of the New Testament church, to be able to be um, part of um, Christ's body, and to be able to be part of this inheritance that he has planned for us. Okay, so moving on to verse 7. In whom, in whom that being Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. So that word there, uh, hath abounded, it's the word uh, parousio, which means excess or abundant. And the word uh, for prudence is, is a word for nasus, which means moral insight. You know, God's given us spiritual sight, spiritual eyes to be able to discern. And he's given wisdom to the church. He's given truth and wisdom to the church to be able to understand through the Holy Spirit uh, giving us that, that wisdom and understanding. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and in which are in earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained. So we've got another, uh, we've got a semicolon there. It's not... I'm sorry, a colon there, even in him. Colon. Okay, so now after the colon, we get to the, the root of the, the matter. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, this inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And because of this, we should be to, again, that word should be there. We should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Okay? So, yeah, we see there that what was predestinated, what was predestinated is that those who are within the church, who are within churches, who are following in that new covenant, we will... Uh, we have obtained an inheritance. Okay? That word for have obtained is klerou, which means to allot, to set apart an inheritance, to assign. So that has been determined before time that God has decided that this plan will be enacted. And they didn't know about that in the Old Testament. They didn't know about that before Jesus Christ came and preached the good news, preached the gospel. Uh, the good news about this, this new covenant that both Gentile and Jew would be able to be a part of and serve God together in. Now, who, who are these people that, that are being talked about who first trusted in Christ? Who, who could Paul be referring to when he says that? That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Who are those people? So to, to get a good, good understanding, a, a more full understanding of who those people are and who the Ephesians are, let's go back to Acts chapter 18. We're going to read through and study uh, what happened at Ephesus. Who is this group that Paul is writing to? So we can understand in a little bit more in depth what uh, Paul is talking about. So Acts chapter 18, let's start at verse 19. Sorry, we'll start at verse 18. 18, 18. And Paul after this tarried there yet a good while and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria. 
And with him, Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Contraea, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not. So we've got Paul now at Ephesus, and Priscilla and Aquila came with him. Saying, uh, so, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus, and when he landed at Caesarea, and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after the, he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia, in order to strengthen all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews that public and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, yeah, moving on to chapter 19, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. So now Paul's come back to Ephesus and he's, he's um, finding these disciples that, you know, before Paul had laid the seed, and then Apollos came, and then Apollos helped to bring in the harvest, so to speak, and then, so these people have believed on Jesus Christ, they've been baptized under John, they, they only knew about John the Baptist, they didn't know Jesus Christ had come yet, because Apollos didn't know that, okay, but they, John had said, you know, the kingdom of God is here, it's coming, it's, it's at hand, so he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, Paul is talking to the, uh, the disciples at Ephesus, And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which had come after him, that is, on, Jesus, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve, and he went into the synagogue and spake boldly, for the space of three months, disputing and persuading. Oh, you know what? We will. Okay, we'll go on to verse 12. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when diverse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out from them. Okay, so we've got the, the context here of who these Ephesians are. And we see that there are, yeah, like Pastor said, they're a mix of Jews and Gentiles who are believers. 
And they've been baptized by Paul, and the Holy Spirit came down on them after that. And so we move on to verse 13 through 14. So we, we're going to see some references to that incident, okay, which is why I wanted to read back in Acts. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. Sorry, verse 13. Okay. After that ye heard the word of truth, um, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And there we get, we're already on, on uh, the fourth sentence, okay? That's the fourth sentence. We see here that he says the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, and that that word there for earnest, it's arhaban. And it means a down payment. It's like when you buy a house and you, you put down a deposit. The Holy Spirit living among us in the church is a down payment for something much greater. The final payment hasn't come yet. Of our inheritance, it's the earnest of our inheritance, the down payment of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. And that word purchased possession, or the acquisition, the uh, obtaining, okay? So, um, this, what is that purchased possession? Anyone? Us. Us, yes. Yes, Christ, when he came and died on the cross, he paid the price for us, right? So it's when, you know, he will, he has sent the Holy Spirit as a deposit, but later he will come and we will be with him. Okay, so now moving on to verse 15 through 23, the last sentence. So this last sentence comprises a total of nine verses, right? Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So he's praying, he's saying, I'm praying for you guys that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance uh, um, of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believed uh, believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head, God gave to Christ to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Amen. So Paul's saying here, you know, the, the verses before, you know, we see leading up to this, he's giving the glory to, to God, he's giving the glory to Jesus Christ, and he's saying, you know, and, and you guys have followed in the Lord, in verse 13 through 14, in whom you also 
trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? And now he, he says, you know, and I've prayed for you guys. I have been praying for you. That you can understand fully, you can understand fully what this calling is all about. What is the hope of this calling? Okay, what do we hope for? What is yet to come? Okay, because we're going to see through the book of Ephesus that he gives a lot of things to the, the Ephesians to say, you know, th this is how we can live expediently, and this is how we can um, keep this, you know, this, this new covenant. This is how we can keep the New Testament church. He talks and, uh, and gives them a lot of instructions later on. But he wants them to understand what is the end game? What is the goal here? What is the hope of his calling? And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to to the working of his mighty power. So this is kind of a summary here. I'm praying that, that God helps to reveal to you what these things are. And then as we go through the book of Ephesians, Paul is going to lay out these things to help us understand, to help them understand and us understand what these things are. Which he wrought in, so that power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at, set Jesus Christ at God's right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named. So God is, Jesus Christ is in the ultimate authority. He is the king of the kingdom of God. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things in the church, which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So we can see how this all is interconnected in this chapter here. How it's all interconnected, what Paul is saying. Well, I mean, we don't want to just take one verse or two verses here or just take a part of a sentence here. We want to take the whole thing together to understand that the, the whole purpose here that Paul wants them to understand is this plan that God had before the foundation of the world, that these believers at Ephesus could be part of this new covenant plan and could that not just the believers at Ephesus but us also could be um, holy and blameless before God and be part of this adoption of children be, be able to rightfully inherit through the blood of Christ rightfully inherit all things with Jesus Christ so it's about inheritance it's about the new covenant not talking about uh, salvation, though, that is a prerequisite, but this is not speaking directly about salvation or being predestinated to salvation or anything like that, okay? And I hope that's clear going through this, this uh, chapter here. But ultimately, Jesus Christ is in control. He is in power. You know, and we watch... We watch as like the, the elections go on, right? We see, you know, this person wins or that person wins, and and you know you can disagree with this person or that person, but at the at the end of the day, these earthly kingdoms are nothing. They are nothing. They are temporary, and they will fall. And at the end of the day, Jesus Christ is Lord, and He will rule over all. He is in control of all. And when he plans to come back, he will come back. And at that time, you know, there's, there's a reason why we serve. There's a reason why we serve within a New Testament church because he has something so great planned for us that we can't even, you know, the, the flowery and impressive words, the, the long words in the Greek that Paul uses here can't even begin to describe what is in store for us and why we are looking forward, why we are looking forward to that time when he will return. What is that hope of our calling 
but but we will go through and at least try to understand try to broaden our understanding of these things that Paul wants to lay out for us okay any questions or comments okay so next time we will start in chapter 2 thank you